there is a town in Rhode Island. It's actually the capital of Rhode Island. It's called Providence. And it didn't get the name Providence by accident. It was actually like Plymouth Plantation and other places. It was actually founded by a group of Baptists. And they gave it the name Providence because they felt like God was directing their steps. And today we're talking about a passage in Genesis 24 that talks about how God directs every step of our lives. The psalmist said, in essence, mankind makes the plans, but God directs the steps or the footprints. And I want to ask you today, do you believe that? When you go to work, when you invest in something, when you entertain a relationship, when you buy or sell something, do you believe that God has gone before you, whether seen or unseen, and often it's unseen, and directs the process, and directs the steps? Because it changes the way you pray. Because you begin to pray, God, I'm planning to do this and this, but like Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will, Lord, direct the steps. And that's the way a Christian's life should be. It's part of the foundation of a Christian life. And as we're looking at foundations revisited, Today we want to look at the providence of God in our daily lives through the lens of Isaac's soon-to-be wife and the discovery of that wife, Rebecca. Genesis chapter 24, we'll only do half the chapter today, it's a long chapter. And I've said the concept of a creation responsible to a creator is the only solid foundation for personal, national, global health and security in our world. Could you imagine if every politician said to themselves, God, what do you want for me tomorrow? Now, it's great because there are politicians out there who are Christians and they pray and they pray even for their opponents and they pray about the next step of God's providence in our government. And that's a solid foundation for any nation. It's when a person gets away from that and they begin to say, well, you know what? I'm my own island. I can call the shots. And people who have money and power and political influence begin to get to the point where they think that that is true and it's never true. In fact, it's interesting, if you read the early documents of the founding of our nation, over and over and over again it says, by the providence of God, we do these things, we declare these things, by the providence of God. That means by the guidance of God, by the step-by-step -step involvement of God going ahead of us. And it's still true, whether you're running a business or you're teaching in school, you're uh, running a household. Well, we want to look at Genesis 24 and finding a wife for Isaac. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says this event emphasizes, again, that word, the providential working of God in the circumstances of his faithful servants. The key idea in the passage is the word kesed or loyal love, or loyalty to the covenant. That is a very unique Hebrew word, chesed love, both from both God's perspective and man's. Now, unfortunately, the NIV translates it kindness. Kindness doesn't cut it. This is an intense, it's a covenant love, almost like in marriage, where God says, I will bind myself to you for your good and 
A person says, I will bind myself to you, God, in this loving covenant. So unfortunately, the word kindness doesn't convey the full meaning of this loyal love. It's extremely intense and dependent on God, but mostly it's God's covenant love coming toward us. Now Abraham sends Eleazar, his senior servant, 450 miles to find a wife for Isaac in this chapter 24. Now in chapter 24, Eleazar is not mentioned. So how do I know who the senior head servant is of Abraham? Well, it tells us back in chapter 15. He's named in chapter 15, verse 2. So we've just extrapolated that. But when we go to Genesis 24, verse 1, Abraham was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to, his senior, to the senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, he trusted him. Put your hand under my thigh. Now that's a covenant agreement there. It's the way they did treaties. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son, Isaac, from the daughters of the Canaanites. Why? Well, you're going to find out that not only was Rebecca kind of a mixed bag, but it would have been worse if they had gotten a wife from the Canaanites because the Canaanites were very, very vocal about worshiping false gods. And that would have dragged down the family. We see that. I mean, by the time we get to Solomon, all the foreign wives, and he erected altars for all these uh, terrible, terrible pagan gods for the wives and the concubines that he had accumulated over the years. And so God said, I, I want to purify this as much as possible from the start, knowing that we're going to go up there 450 miles away to Abram's home country, where Abram's brother lives, and we're going to get a wife there, but it's still down the road has its potential problems, but it's the best we've got in a broken world. So he said, I want you to swear by heaven and earth, but that you will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. Now, 450 miles. And you're going to find out he's traveling with 10 loaded camels. And it's going to take months for him to get there and back. So Abraham's not going to have an answer. Isaac's not going to have an answer right away. And this is a process for providence. I want you to see how faithful this servant is in a couple of moments. What chapter 24 tells us, and God tells us in this covenant, is that the promise is here in the land. So he said, don't take a wife from the land. And remember last week we talked about Sarah not returning to Abraham's home area because Abraham was staking a new claim. The only possession he had was the, uh, the cave and the field there in Canaanite territory that he bought. But he was staking his claim saying, my home is not up in Mesopotamia anymore. My home is right here in what God has promised me in the land, even though I only own this little portion. Because you remember, you would usually go back to your home area to bury your dead in this culture. He didn't do that with Sarah. The promise then is here in the land, but the wife is not. Verse 5, the servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Do you know what that presupposes? God's already picked out a woman. And God's already gone ahead of time. And God's working in this. Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? 
Okay, the servant's thinking. He's a very obedient servant. He's definitely a person of faith like Abraham was. And Abraham's faith filtered all the way down to every part of his household. Here's what Abraham says. Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. Because that's not where the promise is. The promise is in the land of Israel. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me on oath, saying to your offspring, I will give this land, the land of Israel, he will send his angel before you, providence, preparing the way, so that you can get a wife for my son from there. Now let me ask you a question. When Abraham lived in Ur and up in Mesopotamia, was he in the early stages of his life a wonderful believer in Jehovah? Not at all. He had foreign gods just like his brothers and sisters did, just like his father did. He was basically a pagan. He was basically worshiping, you know, whatever was there, the sun, moon, stars, that kind of thing. And Jehovah God tapped him, the real God tapped him on the shoulder and said, Abraham, I want to enlighten you. I want to tell you about myself. I'm the one who created everything. So don't worship that stone because I created it. Don't worship that tree because I created it. And you don't worship the creation, you worship the creator. And so that was a turning point. He left her. That was a turning point for him to travel. And God said, let's get you out of here. Let's go to a land that I'll show you. And he began to worship the true and living God and began to influence the culture around him. That's what Israel was supposed to do. And these promises came in Genesis chapter 12 and on. To your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you. God will prepare the way so that you can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, Abraham said, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master, Abraham, and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. All right, that oath was so severe that if the servant broke the oath, Abraham had the right to hunt him down and kill him. That's the way that oath worked, to take it out on him. So the servant was being wise and basically saying, hey, I don't want to swear to an oath that I can't do, and if this woman doesn't want to come along, am I freed from that? And he says, yes, you will be. That's in God's hands. Again, Abraham believed in providence. Faith in the providence and guidance of God. Verse 10. Then the servant left, remember he's going to be traveling for months, taking, taking with him ten of his master's camels loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for Aram Naharim, they're hard to pronounce, and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. So he traveled for months. He got to this place where Abram's brother would live. It was toward evening, the time the women go out to draw water. Why do the women go out in the evening to draw water? It's cooler instead of going out in the heat of the day. And you got to understand something. Water was a problem here. We're talking about a desert type thing. The only way you get water was from a flowing stream or a cistern that had been dug that you would pour water into as a storage facility or a well. And there were not that many of them. So it was a chore. Let me show you. So here we are. This is the land, little land of Israel. 
Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee. Uh, Hebron is over in this area, even though the, the label's there. And this is up, this is the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, and this is up in the area of Nahor. So he's 450 miles going up that direction. Now here's what I want you to see, and I wish it was true also of not only your family, my family, but especially of communities and politics. Because there's a great example here. When faith flows from family and community leadership, in other words, Abraham was so vocal about his faith, about how God providentially led him every step of the way, that it filtered down. Verse 12, then he prayed. This is the servant praying. Okay? So he had learned prayer from whom? Abraham, serving under him all those years. Lord God of my master, Abraham. But you've got to understand, he's praying, so it's his God too. Make me successful today and show kindness to my master, Abraham. Do you get up in the morning and pray that? Lord, make me successful today by your terms, not mine. My terms would be, Lord, make me successful today. I want a million dollars. I want to win the lottery. Okay? That's not what he's doing. Make me successful today by spiritual standards. Make me successful today. Regardless of what my business does, regardless of, of uh, what is happening in my family or on my job, make me spiritually successful today and show me your kindness by your providence. See, I am standing beside this spring. Very specific prayers. Do you have that kind of specific prayer? And you may not always see the answer. I mean, this was one of those circumstances where bing, 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 it was answered. But there are lots of times where God's working behind, behind the scenes. You never even see what's going on. See, I'm standing behind, beside this spring, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar, that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Very, very specific prayer. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. Now think about that. Maybe a dozen women out there, maybe more. We don't know. And his prayer is, God, you do the picking. Because if I were to pick, I would, I don't know, maybe pick on looks. Maybe I pick on strength. Maybe I, you know, pick on how she treated the animal. I, I, I don't know, God, but you need to decide. Let her be the one that you've chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness, and that's that word again, loyal love to my master. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says Eliezer trusted the Lord to grant him specific leading. That's the way we need to be praying, even if you don't see it. He prayed that Isaac's future bride would give him and his camels water to drink. Simple kind of thing, but a lot of work involved. To water ten thirsty camels involved much work, for camels guzzle great amounts of water. At the town of Nahor, northwest Mesopotamia, he received a precise answer to his prayers. He went to the family town, and he said, God, do this. God sometimes moves before we even finish praying. And sometimes it doesn't seem like he does, and that's the frustrating point. Verse 15, before he had finished praying, do you know how many times that happens in the Bible? I don't know a specific number. But there are places where it says, before this person, Daniel is one of them. 
Before he even finished praying, God dispatched his angel Gabriel to answer that prayer. Before he had finished praying, and remember, who's going before? The angel of the Lord. God had a plan. Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. Now, she just thought it was a routine day. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nabor. So this was a family relative. Now, you need to understand the laws of incest are not in effect. They won't come into effect until Moses later on. And the population was small enough that this was not um, a, a, a biologically dangerous situation. This is what had to happen in terms of faith. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. So she's doing her routine. The servant hurried to meet her and said, please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. So she was gracious, she was beautiful, she was sharp. And after she had given him a drink, verse 19, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too. Tells you something about her character. Until they have had enough to drink. That's a lot of trips for 10 camels. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water and draw enough for all of his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. So he's still not quite sure. He's still waiting for the providence of God and the confirmation. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold nose ring weighing a becca and two gold bracelets weighing 10 shekels. And then he asked, whose daughter are you? Because at this point he still doesn't know. Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? Now you might say, well, that's rather presumptuous. It's like me coming to your door and saying, hey, can I stay here tonight? We don't tend to do that. But in that day, if you traveled 450 miles, you might ask, because there weren't a lot of, you know, days ins and, and, and Hyatt Regencies and other places like that, uh, you would basically stay with someone. And you might stay there for a month. And I'll talk about wearing out your welcome. Verse 24, she answered him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, born bore to Nahor, that Milcah bore to Nahor. And she added, we have plenty of straw and fodder as well as room for you to spend the night. So she was gracious. She wasn't being presumptuous on her family. Bible knowledge commentary once again says, in gratitude, he gave the girl some expensive jewelry. Now remember, he came loaded with, with gifts and supplies and everything else. A gold nose ring weighing a becca, which is about a half a shekel or a fifth of an ounce. I don't really know what that comes to or how valuable it might be. And two gold bracelets weighing ten shekels or about four ounces, so, you know, uh, a quarter or a third of a pound. He asked if there was room at her father's house in which to stay overnight. Again, she revealed her kindness by offering him not only a place to stay, but also taking care of his animals after that 450 mile trip. Now I want you to see what happens with this servant, the praise and worship that looks to God's daily involvement. And this is why we worship personally. Verse 26, then the man bowed down and worshiped the Lord saying, praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness, again, there's that word, that covenant love, and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. So what does this servant do? He learned praise and prayer and worship and providence 
from Abraham. It became a part of his life, extended to his family. He takes this trip and he's applying it in prayer and worship and praise because he understands that God is a God that tomorrow morning is going to go before you if you let him, if you talk to him about it. And it's interesting because the book of Daniel and other places in the scripture says that God raises up and tears down kingdoms for his purposes. So God's going to do what he wants to do to accomplish his purposes. The question is, do you want to be a participant in it? Do you want to go along for the joy ride? Do you want to go along to enjoy what God is doing in a life? A history of trusting the providence of God. I want to close with this today. I did some research. There are 42 places in the world, cities, that have the name Providence. Why? Because at the time when they were being named, these were people who were looking to God to go before them step by step, whether it's building a city or building a family or building a life. Now let me ask you, are we a nation that's looking to the providence of God? Sadly, not anymore. Some people are, and I think that's the glue that holds everything together. And once we lose that completely, we're in trouble. But we ought to have political leaders. We ought to have community leaders. We ought to have family members and heads of family that talk about if it's God's will, we will do such and such. That's what the book of James says. He says, you want to run a business? That's what James says. And you say to yourself, well, I'm going to do this and accomplish this and accomplish this and accomplish this. And he says, no, your life's a vapor. Because who knows? So he says, go before God in humble humility and say, God, if you will, this is my plan, now direct the steps. If you will, this is what I want to accomplish. And there's nothing wrong with saying that and put it out there with God. But God, what really matters is what Jesus did just before the cross. I want this, but nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but yours. We ought to find ourselves saying that over and over and meaning it steps in our lives. So there are 42 places in the world named Providence. And Providence can be found in 11 countries throughout the world, that name. In some countries, like America, Jamaica, other places, it's more than once. In fact, America has the highest number of places called Providence. Why do you think that is? Because of our founding fathers, our founding people who put together this nation. And it's spread across 22 different regions of America. So here's my closing question. Are you a believer in the providence of God? Is this church focused on the providence of God? Because that's really what makes the difference. That makes the ride of life a joy. You're not fighting, you're not swimming uphill, you're not saying, oh, I make my plans and they fall apart. And you know what, that doesn't mean things don't fall apart. Sometimes God tears down nations. Sometimes God lets families disintegrate because of choices people have made. Are you a believer in the providence of God? And will it show step by step? Let's close. Our Lord, our God, thank you so much for your faithfulness to us. And just like the servant of Abraham and Abraham, we look to the providence of God to direct our steps. And for that, we give you thanks. Help us to, whether it's going to vote, whether it's running a business or teaching or running a household, help us, Lord 
to say, God, what do you want next? You're in a new job. God, I want you to go before me step by step. Not your will, but not my will, but your will, Lord. We give you thanks in Jesus' name.